That, in part, is what we're going to be talking about in today's presentations. And to help us to, to explore these ideas further, we begin our day with a presentation from Dr. Pauletta Otis. Dr. Otis is Professor of Security Studies at the Command and Staff College, Marine Corps University. She received her PhD from the Graduate School of International Studies at the University of Denver, and she also holds graduate degrees in anthropology, political science, and international studies. Dr. Otis has conducted field research in, in conflict situations in South Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, and the Eastern Mediterranean, and she has also served as a member of the Defense Intelligence Advisory Board. Prior to assuming her current position with the Marine Corps, Dr. Otis served as Professor of International Strategic Studies at the Joint Military Intelligence College and as Professor of Political Science and International Studies at Colorado State University, Pueblo. Widely published in the fields of anthropology, religion, and security studies, Dr. Otis's current research focuses on issues concerning cultural factors that impact military strategy and operations, religious factors in violence and irregular warfare and insurgency analysis. It's a privilege for us to have her with us today. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage. When these wonderful friends of mine invited me to come speak here without a second thought, which I should have known better, without a second thought, I said, well, of course. I love the audience. I've never been to Newport. I love the subject. I'm passionate about it. Yes, uh, I have a death wish, a little bit masochistic, because anybody who puts together culture, religion, military operations for a group of ethicists has to be slightly bonkers. So, so I, I am positive, without a doubt, that I will offend absolutely everyone in this audience at least once this morning. So please have patience with me because the, the subject is difficult and there are no um, correct answers. There are some answers that are better than others and I wanted to see if we can get to some of those. Now, working for the Marine Corps, I'm also very glad, thank you very much, that you gave, gave me a round trip ticket. They usually give me a ticket one way. Okay, let's see if we can get this to work here. All right, when I'm working with the Marine Corps, one of the things that they, they say is, Dr. Otis, we've been cultured to death. We've been religioned to death. We understand that we need to know this stuff, right? The Marine Corps told us to get culture five years ago, so we did, All right? And, it, and in some respects, that's absolutely correct, that it, the operational force learned because they had to learn to accomplish the mission. And that's good on, good on them all the way around, across the board and all of the services, they've really done a, a great job of it. On the other hand, it has not been institutionalized. And one of the things that we rather forgot along the way is that teaching culture about cultures and teaching about religions of the world gives service people more power. Knowledge is power. But that power can be as misused as it can be used for mission success and mission accomplishment. And what we have found is that in some cases, cultural information or religious information has been misused, taken out of context, or used for purposes for which it was not intended and which would be considered unethical in some, some cir circles, including probably this one. So my contention this morning is, number one, culture matters, religion matters, the fog of warfare, particularly in counterinsurgency, joint operations, international operations, interagency operations, all these create a strategic anxiety that we have an obligation to sort through and help these young men and women as they go out to serve our country. I had a hour phone call from my son in Helmand Province at Camp Leatherneck between two and three o'clock this morning. It sort of brings reality down to, uh, um, down to base level here. I have a personal interest, but I also have a citizenship interest. And when you work with the young men and women who are dedicated to this country, it's an obligation for us to take this a lot more seriously and see if we can help factor in how to use the knowledge as power in appropriate ways for mission success and to accomplish the foreign policy goals of this country. All right, this is the agenda. If you can believe it, I know I'm not going to be here for the entire year, but we're going to t you know, take it on. And, a duo wave top for it. 
So the first thing we're going to talk about is culture, what it is, how we use it, the ethical dimensions of it, religion, another a perspective that perhaps you haven't um, uh, approached yet, the relationship between culture and religion, which has the most explanatory power in which, in which areas of the world, which the operational environments, then uh, the current operational environment and what we call full spectrum operations, joint operations, and the types and ranges of, of I've found 37 different types of missions that the Marine Corps does. Then how to integrate ethics into the teaching and training of this, and then some ideas about how to think about talking about these things in maybe a little bit more uh, intelligent, compassionate manner instead of yelling at each other about who's most right. All right, cultural assumptions, beliefs, behaviors, ethnic group, usually uh, defined as something that is generational, right? The, any cultural definition that you find will have those elements of it. Sometimes it's strung together differently, but they're always there. Uh, they seem, it is seen in complex relationships, and these never change, they never vary. The, you can call them uh, triple, if you like. It is territory, religion, identity, politics, language, or communications, and then the economics. All parts of culture are interrelated in these complex uh, arenas, and if you find one, you will find the other. Now, if you notice when you have guest speakers, if you have a geographer, they're explaining the entire world by geography. Fine, it's a prism. If you have a person who's interested in religion, they will define everything in the religious prism. Fine, that's fine, no problem. If you have someone who does economics, his guest speaker, they're your SMEs, they'll define it as everything has to do with economics somewhere or the other. All of these are fine as long as they include all the other elements of the culture for a more robust explanatory framework. Culture changes, sorry, nothing stays the same. When we went into Iraq, unfortunately, we had information that was 30 years old. We depended on that information. Some of it was wrong. The learning curve was the guys coming back, left seat, right seat, putting it back into the lesson learns agenda, and we adapted on the ground to what was happening. That was unfair of the academic community, and it was unfair of the military community to send our guys out without current information that we need. Uh, example of this in 2003, the, the way the Iraqi, Iraqi people or government was talking about um, their mission and where their military was was through Arabic poetry. We thought it was poetry. They had place, location, and timing embedded in their poetry, and we had no clue, right? We found out later with someone who actually knew something about Arabic poetry. Uh, culture changes, war changes culture more than any other factor because it is more dramatic. War changes culture and cultures change the way wars are, are pursued. All right, this is the bad prism diagram thing. I, I'm not as good at PowerPoint as some of the PowerPoint rangers we have. But what it means is that in culture all of these things are related. And it's, it's idiot proof. Actually, you know, you go into a new arena and you say, okay, where am I? What language do they speak? What's the currency here? It's not difficult to do. The nuances come later, but the nuances are nuances. They're not the, the critical elements. It's easy to get through a cultural analysis by simply using this. And whether or not we're doing those um, Marine Corps culture cards or information operations or cargo pocket warmers, whatever we have, if it doesn't have all of these elements on it, it's probably missing something because all cultures have these components. All right. On the other hand, I s you know, it, it's easy to make that statement, but then I say, okay, guys, you're going to go into, uh, oh, say, Sudan or Chechnya or, or uh, Burma tomorrow. What would you need to know? When would you need to know it? How much is too much information, information overload, so that you're sending people out with information they don't need for the type of mission that they're doing? We don't have those very well articulated yet, all right? The challenges, this is not a new problem. I'm sorry, culture is not new for military forces. We've been doing, the Marine Corps has been doing this since the shores of Tripoli. What are you gonna find when you get there? How do you act with the people? How do you hire people to work for you? Remember how that kind of worked out? We did the shores of Montezuma, thank you very much. Uh, we've got all of the uh, operations in Latin America, the ones in, First and Second World War, First and Second World War, we sent out pamphlets with the guys to Germany, to Australia, to Russia, to tell them how to behave. Those things are still at the war office in London and in our war office. We also had one in Iraq that was published in 1943 
which was pretty good, which we forgot that we had. So anybody going abroad knows that. They have to know these kinds of things. They want to know it, and they shouldn't have to get it on the plane going over. You know, we have an obligation to them. Uh, sometimes, however, we've given them too much, too little, the wrong kind, uh, information overload for the kind of missions that they were doing, or we've trained and taught in a, in a static environment here without actually having um, any kind of interaction and problem-solving agenda for them. Now, we also have relied too much on a, on, on a profession of anthropology and cultural anthropologists. I will say that I have been one, I am one. When I go out, it frames the way I think about cultures. On the other hand, to rely on a particular profession rather than their methodology means that you're not taking from the academic world what you need for your military operations. Never take anything carte blanche. Know that about geographers and economics and political scientists. Why wouldn't you know that about culture also? So take what you need from that profession, leave the rest, and don't worry about what they think about the use or misuse of information. You have your own ethical standards about how you're going to use that information, or should have. All right. Now, the, the problem of standalone or integrated teaching and training. The Army has tried to do the human training systems. The Air Force has some uh, new cultural center down at uh, Mac uh, Maxwell, I think. The uh, Navy, I'm not quite sure what you're doing. I'll have to get caught up on that. The Marine Corps has a standalone setting. And we've decided to say we're going to have a culture setting here. They have worked a little bit. $60 million in the human train systems, but we still cannot point and click and find out who lives there and what to do about it. All right? $60 million later. That's just the Army. And that's just the above board cost, right? not the human energy put into it. The Marine Corps has the CAOCO, and we have MCIA, classified and non classified, uh, collecting information and putting it out. Fine. The other option is to teach and train along the way in every one of the classes about what culture is. Culture is not just a way to be nice to people, it's a way to understand and leverage information for mission success, period. That's what the military is about. You're not going out trying to win friends and influence people. Hearts and minds is another issue we can talk about, but the purpose of information is to get your mission accomplished better. Um, so we have both of these arguments whether or not it should be integrated or whether it should be standalone. Now, knowledge is power. Anything that you have at your disposal to manipulate or influence, I didn't use that word manipulate, did I? To influence or have power over another human being has to have a knowledge of the implications of that use of power. So there's both short-term implications and long-term implications. You can usually get a short-term job done. The long-term implications is whether 30 years from now they're going to consider you still a friend or whether or not they're going to consider you a permanent enemy because you did what was necessary for your mission accomplishment but not in relationship to the long-term strategic interests of the United States or the people living there. All right? So we have examples of cultural knowledge, which is good. We At the Army, at, uh, when they first went in and checkpoints, the Army and the Marine Corps interpreted this as stop. You go, go into military gates as a civilian. I have this question. What's this? Okay. <laughs> that does not correspond to anything in civilian life. There are other gate uh, single signals. The civilians simply don't know. Well, one of the things that we did in Iraq was send the guys out with halt signs that went like this. That's hello. Right? So we had 24 people killed at checkpoints before we realized that people thought in this cultural context the guards were waving at them. Yeah. We had to learn that. So understanding or being sympathetic or being sensitive is not enough. The information is power. So that's an illustration of one of the bad things. Negotiation strategies that we've tried to teach and train to, appropriate uh, uh, use and checkpoints or searching of houses, we've learned not to kick down doors, but to please knock first and knock to stand off at appropriate distance. We have knowledge as power, and we've used that in operational settings, and, and you can find them in the lessons learned in all of the services. Pretty good stuff, and, but it is also an example. The cultural knowledge needs an ethical dimension to it so that people think about the long-term and the short-term effects of what they're doing in that, in that setting. Um, Another example is 
right now we have um, transfer of forces between um, the 82nd Marine Corps, now the 82nd again, one area. We have some transfer of forces in, in Anbar province. We have some transfer of forces in places in Afghanistan. And the, there's a tendency for new guys to come in hot, right? They want to do better than the people before them. They want to play with the toys. They come in too hot. And even with the left seat, right seat uh, type of military operation, what tends to happen is there's an escalation of violence after a new force comes in, rather than keeping it at the level of, of force and at, at which the, the, the current situation would require, right? Uh, use of information, long-term and short-term mission success and coordination. We have Air Force um, uh, guys running provinces, not from the air, but from the ground, differently than the Marine Corps does. The Army and the Marine Corps never do the same things the same way. You put in the, the British and the Bangladeshis and other international forces, and you have a different type of force projection in each way and a different understanding of the culture and how to use it. That has to, that has to change. Okay. All right, this is my slide for religion. And the, the reason I put this up is it gives an illustration of a violent instance in every one of the world's major religious traditions. It also is an indication of where we can screw things up without even trying because there are religious traditions which are not necessarily mainstream. On the right lower hand side, this was uh, Fallujah 1. We, what happened was that uh, somebody took one of the Marine Corps recruiting posters, cut a uh, postcard sized pamphlet out, and wrote, the, four, the eyes of the coalition are on you, you cannot escape. All right? Sounds OK. I'm going to th throw down 3,000 pamphlets on Friday morning, Fallujah, to tell people to calm down. The next day, the uh, Blackwater guys were slaughtered not as sheep, but as goats. Right? Got a little religious significance there? Now, I'm not equating pamphlets with killing, and neither am I saying that there is a cause and effect. But that pamphlet was for very poor forest protection because what green eyes symbolize in this area of the world is, oh, let's see, the Kurds, the Masons, the Chinese who invaded in the 1500s had green eyes on their ships, the genie from the mountains, all of these kinds of things that we know in Christian and Jewish and Muslim literature to be associated with evil eye, Malojo, anybody from Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Malojo, you know, got to be careful those kinds of things. What we were doing was equal to um, putting a phallic symbol pamphlets over the uh, papal palace in Rome on Easter Sunday morning. Right? It was simply not a wise thing to do. However, is that Quranic? Is that is Islamic? No way. Not any more than the Easter Bunny is Christian. There's a relationship, but you're not going to find it in the Bible. You're not going to find it in the code. You only find it when you know the culture and the customs and the religion of that area on the ground. All right? OK. Now, assumptions. The major assumption, and I'm using religion not in the sense of church, but in the sense of, the, of religion with the small r. Religion for an anthropologist or someone who studies global religious arena. Re religion's major purpose is to explain life and death. Therefore, at any, any religious um, code or any religious teaching you go into, any culture, their religion, with or without a God factor, will say, this is why people are born, this is why people live, this is why people die. And even when people do not believe in a God factor, eternal life, whatever, they'll use words that say, grandma passed on, grandma went to the other side, grandpa has taken on a new life, grandpa isn't with us anymore, grandpa's on the other side of the river, we will see grandpa again or we won't. But whatever it is, we embed the ideas of life and death in language. Therefore, there's a tendency like Scott Appleby and other uh, scholars on religion and religious violence to say, okay, there's militant peacemakers and there's people who are militant troublemakers because the passion is about life and death itself.
This resonates with the military community because that's also what you're basically about. Under what conditions do you take life as a group? It's not, if it's not murder, then it's warfare. What are the differences? What are the parameters? What is just war? What is not just war? Every culture, every religion has rules of warfare and ideas about the sanctity of life itself. Now, whether you uh, go into a tribal area like I have in either Latin America or South Asia or whatever, you sit around a circle and people will explain to you their group, what life is about, how God created it, between the Hopi and the Navajo and the uh, Cunha Indians, whatever they will explain, how wonderful life is because it has been created. Therefore, all cultures, all religions have to have enough reason to take life as a group. They all have the rules. Just because you don't know what they are does not mean they don't have them. Right? Usually we just don't bother asking because we think they're so different than we are that they couldn't possibly have rules of warfare because they don't do it like we do it. So instead of seeing the moat in our own eye, we see the moat in their eye. And it works out for us, but it doesn't necessarily work out for them. All right. Religious violence is global. All religions and all cultures have religious violence. It's shown in three ways. You can have psychosocial violence where you're prejudiced. You say, I just don't want my child ma marrying one of them. I don't want them going to school together, or I prefer not to buy my car from them. Whatever it is, that so psychosocial vi violence is, a, is a, the head and the mind and the way we want to increase predictability in our own life. The second way is structural violence, and that's where we put in laws and codes. You will not be this, you will not do this in your religious practice in uniform. You will not do this in your religious practice. As a cop, you may not uh, rebuild your church with, with indoor plumbing. Right? You can't do that in this government because you have to have a historical artifact license to do it. Whatever it is, we can structure relationships between religions and do so in every single culture in the world, including ours, even though we like to say all religions are equal or equally dissimilar, right? It doesn't matter, we have them. We just don't, are, are not always aware of the ones in our own culture. Uh, check out the uh, attitudes towards Wicca, peyote cults, ghost dances, etc. We have some things which we simply don't allow, period. And they are religions, all right? And the third is actual violence. And we find that religion is always associated with violence. You cannot have a war without having a religious input into it because religion in the, as it base is what explained why people are born and why they live and why they die. So with or without a transcendent factor in every warfare, religion will be part of that war. One of the reasons we think that the Middle East has more war than, more religion than any other part is the way religion was mobilized in warfare environments. When it is mobilized in those warfare environments, it becomes more visible to the outsider because it, it has been mobilized and has been used to support the ideas of just war and how those wars will be fought, right? Uh, religion uh, tends to heighten lethality. The more religion is associated with that war, the more likely it is to have indicators of severity, intensity, duration, scope. Uh, those measures of lethality are associated with how much religion is plays a part in, in that violent situation. Where religion plays a role is both ideology and instrumentality. As an ideology, it is not predictive. You cannot predict, if I said this morning, I'm a Christian, you still don't have a clue what I'm gonna do this afternoon. I'm sorry, it may frame my mindset, but it doesn't tell you about my measurable, be measurable behavior. The 1.3 billion Muslims out there, you don't know anything about that. What you have to do is draw it down to the beliefs and behaviors of a small group, a single set, and a smaller group of players. It does not have predictive capability. Ideology, we learned during the Cold War, you can get a lot of mileage out of explaining things, but you can't say, okay, and this is what Albania is gonna do tomorrow. Can't do it, right? It's not possible. Uh, religion is a factor in both peace and conflict. We have more peaceful leveraging power through religion than we have through culture because of survivability and because it explains both life and death. All right. Uh, now, this is the way I kind of download this as a cultural anthropologist because if religion doesn't have predictive power, I want to know how to, how to handle it. One is in the codes. The codes are written or unwritten. 
in traditional societies, they tend to be unwritten and traditional. Doesn't mean they don't have them, it just means we may not be able to find them. Once a code gets written, then we start fighting about it. And some of your um, discussion this afternoon will be fighting over the codes. Terrific, that's what we're supposed to do in a democracy is say, okay, religion, culture, fight over the rules of how we, we're going to do our business because codes are the ideal system, not the actual. Because the actual system, we wouldn't need the code. We are working towards codification in every religious practice, every culture, because we're trying to find out how we can agree together on, on, on our behavior. As a social scientist, I'm happier working with the beliefs and behaviors in small groups where I have more predictability. So if I'm working with terrorism, if I'm working with counterinsurgency, if I'm working with tribal groups in Afghanistan, I want to say, based on this set of facts, based on these behaviors that have gone before, I can reasonably predict with some certainty that this is what's going to happen in the future. I don't like to say, well, let's see, are they Muslim just like they are in Af Iraq, or are they different, or how are they different? What's been their practice? How do they express this in small groups, in ethnic groups, in tribal arenas? What's changing? What are the change dynamics? What can be explained by war, what can be explained by culture, and what can be explained by religion are entirely different kinds of problem sets. All right, and we have a perception problem. You can read this slide only because you're culturally adept at doing so. A flat view of this slide is two little boys with close to guns. Your perception is also an evaluation of them. One will say, ah, child warrior. Which one? One on the left or the right? How do you know? You've read into the slide because of your soda straw of the world. What we have to be careful of is our, what becomes visible in a culture is not necessarily what the reality is. You really don't know about these signs. You think you know, but what you're seeing and reading is based on your background, your perception, and your education. One of the problems we have with religious analysis is that we are all so conceptually challenged and we use words very sloppily. Um, sh we should probably know about it better, but there's a tendency not to want to talk about religion and not, a, not to do it in military environments. This is your chance right now, this morning, so we'll go for it. Um, these definitions come out of Scott Appleby's Harvard Project. I did not make them up. The Harvard Project has, let's see, the shelf of books is about this long, called the Fundamentalism Project. It's dynamic and important. Most people in most cultures belong to the adherent group. Now, the way I explain this is to my 18 to 20 year olds in a public university. Um, under what conditions would you give your life for your country? You know, you're talking about the Declaration of Independence and people who committed treason to be able to sign that thing. Uh, and they'll, the first thing they'll say is, well, somebody attacked my family. Thank you very much, we're glad. Did you call your mother last Sunday night? Well, well mm, he, okay, fine. The, the second one, well, if somebody maybe changed my religion. Okay, do you know the difference between Peter and Paul? Between trans, uh, transmigration, uh, grace and law. Uh, tell me the 12 tribes of Israel. Were Peter and Paul brothers? How much information is, man, we don't go to church, we're in college, which is something like, oh, we don't go to church, we're in the military, right? So the amount of adherence to a religion is something we do on the check a block. Usually, many people, let's see, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, none of the above, uh, well, I'm not one of those, so I'll check this one, right? I'm, I know I'm not Muslim, I know I'm not, Hindu, so I'm, maybe I'm Christian, get the block, put it on the tags, you're good to go, right? But the adherent group, the Christian, religious, Western, whatever, is what we identify ourselves with, with or without information. Over a period of our lifetime, we have that identity thing, whether or not we have any faith in it or knowledge at all. Now, <clears throat> it may surprise you to know, it didn't me, because when I worked with Pew Forum on religion and public policy, one of the things that we, we tried to find out was, which country in the world is the most religious? Okay, 
which people say they believe in God, say they attend church most often or religious service most often, believe that there is life after death, etc. The United States turned out to be the religiously radical country. We have more people who say they believe in God, more people who say they believe in heaven and hell, and more people who claim to attend church, take that with a grain of salt maybe, claim to attend church than any other country in the world, including Iran during the height of the Iranian Revolution. Okay? So we measure adherence in some slightly different ways. Now, two other groups here. One is a fundamentalist. Frankly, according to Scott Appleby's definition, I want to be one. I want my beliefs and behaviors to correspond. That's it. That's the definition of a fundamentalist, beliefs and behaviors. Now, the worst part of fundamentalists are is usually that they're navel-gazing, trying to figure out whether or not that's really true. Let's see, do I tithe on my garage sale or not? Okay. Does the Bible say wine or is grape juice? Okay. Do we do gross or net profit? Uh, do I really consider that a lie or not? Fundamentalists tend to be worried about whether or not God's seeing their beliefs and behaviors as corresponding. All right? That's not a bad thing. What we usually don't prefer <laughs> are people yelling at us in our face saying, you got to do this or you're going to hell. And those are the radicals. Sorry, they're radical. And they get in, the radical extremist gets in your face. Now, most radical extremists are smoke and mirrors, a lot of volume, and you just turn it off. Watch television on Sunday morning. Turn the volume down. See how much you appreciate the body gestures, and whatever else. But, you know, pull it back. The one group that we look at most of, mostly, because we're more worried about them, are the terrorists, all right? If you get 18 to, let's see, the, the last measurement, I think, was 180-some members of Al-Qaeda. But remember, they do not have a membership list with dues. So anybody can belong. And we have a concept like that in political science called free riders. And that's what we saw on the, on the December, December bombing, people who want to belong but um, can't get the t-shirt unless they do something special. All right. So using the words appropriate is probably a good idea. This is where we'll, I'm going to make a statement here that will probably be good for discussion. The framers of the Constitution wanted to separate the power of the church and the power of the state. Look what they just come out of, the wars of church and state in Europe. Nasty stuff. The War of the Roses, red and white in England. Things going on in Germany, Switzerland, the Dutch, and their empire, and France. They wanted to separate the church and state and the power and the money. They were smart to do so. And they wanted to prevent damage. Remember, these are Lockean in philosophy. Limit government as much as possible. And yet, according to some scholars, all of them believe that, the, that religious values were essential to good citizenship. That's with or without the God factor, right? Okay, not without, uh, my own personal beliefs aren't at stake here. With or without the God factor, they believe that those values enhance good citizenship. That's a very different way of looking at things. Church and state are different, and it corresponds to communities of faith and policy. And we meet in the middle, and yell at each other a lot. Right? And that's probably, again, just a good democratic thing to do. Now, religion and culture, prisms. You can take religion or culture, just don't separate them too much. Neither one of them in the and of themselves. You can't say the Arab culture, the American culture, etc. We're not monolithic wholes. I'm not like you, you're not like me, or you're probably saying thank you very much. We are, in the United States, we have a range of behaviors that, uh, that no one likes to say, well, you're just like whatever. All women are, all men are, all anthropologists are. No, forget it. So the, don't you think that Muslims in Iraq resent the same thing? Well, now, all Iraqis, Russians, Chinese, whoever you want to say, we're not monolithic. We have to go back, in warfare particularly, to find out what we need to, to use for predictive power in our analysis. We're internally differentiated. We change over time and circumstance. The Civil War arrangements between religion and the military are different. We're different now than they are, were then, okay? 
whether or not religion has more explanatory power in a Muslim country than Christianity has explanatory power in the United States is highly controversial. I've had people come back and say, well, you know, if you just understand Islam, you understand uh, Saudi Arabia, or you understand Iraq, and I'm saying, no, you don't. I'm sorry. Have you considered water, land, education, political arrangements, uh, distribution of income? Those are also explanatory variables in finding out whether or not these people will commit acts of aggression, acts of war. The religion may be part of it, but it is not a single factor explanation ever, ever, all right? Militants, we have militant peacemakers and militant troublemakers, which I've mentioned, all right? Warfare, what's happened? We've changed from conventional warfare in our emphasis, not that it's not still there, I am talking to the Navy audience, we have conventional warfare, but we also have had and continue to have coin, revolu revolutions, insurgencies, criminal types of that armed groups book that uh, Jeff Norris published from, from this organization. Amazing of different kinds of armed groups out there and the problems they cause in their global environment. We have a range of state and non-state actors that we're taking on in some incredibly complex arenas Add culture, add religion, add these fogs of the new war for your strategic anxiety, and I don't know how our young men and women are doing as well as they have been. And then without, the, without ethics training woven into that and integrated into every one of those things, uh, we will have more problems than we, than we need to have, right? Okay. This one I put in because it's an attention grabber. It takes all of the gigabytes on my slide presentations. But this is, this is for the civilians in the audience. This is the kind of stuff the military guys are looking at these days for the spectrum of operations, right? Look at the type of things that these guys are out there doing. Disaster relief, stability and support, you name it, they're out there having to do it. And you say, well, that's what the State Department should be doing. I'm into reality things here. When the budget is what it is, and the capabilities are what they are for the Defense Department, until the political arena gets a hold of that dilemma and says we will do interagency in our budgeting, which you may not want, okay? When we do interagency in our budgeting, then we can put equal responsibility on state and justice and ag and homeland security, et cetera. If we don't, we're, we're not going to ever even not do these things because the new dimensions in security are economic, political, social, military, and environmental. And unless we have all of those elements of security, we will not be able to have a secure global environment. They all work together at all the different levels of analysis. This is another one. These are missions of a one mu. Right? Just one. The things we ask these guys to do, with or without the cultural information or religious information, integrated, and not necessarily with the definite win that we can live with. Short term, long term. I'm always interested when a politician says, we will win. I'm going to say, win what? Tell me what. The answer is, uh, for the rest of that question, what do you want to win? Okay. We can, as any nuclear power, can destroy anything. What can we build? What can we build for the rest of this world? Right? This is the cultural slide in a <laughs> more academic framework. Campaign phasing. Not only do we have to figure out what the war is, we figure out where we are in the war, whether or not we have stage one, two, three, four, or five, whether or not we're ginning up for war, whether or not we're in the kinetic phase, whether or not we're, cut, we're winding down stability and support operations and turning it over to someone else. And if we don't solve the problems in phase six, we're going back. We usually go back in seven years. This is not fun, all right? Fix it don't have to go back, right? So those phases and stages of warfare are something that we, uh, we build into the planning. All right, this is the bottom line here. If we put people in harm's way without giving them the ethics training to go along with this culture, religion, and this fog of uncertainty in contemporary counterinsurgency movements, we are ethically challenged ourselves. I wanna have one more slide and that's ways of looking at um, how to talk to other people about our religion and our culture. 
The first one is to ignore it. Most people would prefer not talking to religion. Don't talk to me about that. I don't want to hear it. I'm sorry. You go to any place in the world, including your own community, and it's there. Get over it. Get a life and figure out a civilized discourse. You cannot ignore it. It's a choice. You can't ignore it. Number two, exclusivists. Chest pounding. Thank you. I didn't do that quite on purpose. It sounded like it. Exclusive says, my ways or the highway. I have the road to salvation, nobody else does, and the rest of you can take a hike or, or I'm going to have you converted, right? Now, that's fine too. Except in a military environment, you can't proselytize. And it's fine to say, I understand my way is the best way or else you'd change, right? That's not a, it's a personal faith, a personal conviction about exclusivism, that's fine. In a military environment, it's inappropriate because it says that in, in this environment when you're working for mission success, that you can't talk to other people about your faith, okay? Period, can't do it, okay? The pluralist model, and this is the one that sort of makes me wonder. All religions are alike, all cultures are alike, they're all equally good. Why I knew, you know, I, I'll turn to be Buddhist tomorrow, I'll be Shinto the next day, be Baha'i, they're all alike. Well, from an anthropologist standpoint, 90% of religions are alike. 10% differ, and that's where the, where the crux of the matter is often. Pluralism is one way of looking at it. Okay, right? The, it's it's kind of intellectually dishonest because there's a new religion in Africa right now where they bury their children alive to make sure they go to heaven faster. Not necessarily religious pluralism at its best. All right? Another way of dealing with it is the inclusive model, which says, okay, most religions have the same kinds of things in common. They explain life and death, they have rules of warfare, they say don't steal, don't take somebody else's wife, all that other stuff. My way, the 10% that differs is critical to me, but I can talk to everybody else up to that point. Dr. Doug Johnson, who's Navy, graduated from um, Naval <coughs> Academy, was the youngest sub driver that the Navy's ever had, worked for CSIS, did some marvelous things and is now publishing on faith, the missing element in diplomacy and real politique. Um, this is the model he uses. Dr. Chris Seipel uses this model for religious engagement around the world. And you can talk to almost anybody. You don't have to persuade them that that final 5% is what they're missing in their life to be um, a changed person. These come from Scott Appleby's work also in how to talk to and the attitudes that we start when we're working with other people. Ignore it, claim that you're the best and let everybody know it. That's sort of that religious radical part of it. Um, be pluralist and say everybody's alike, which is probably intellectually vacuous. Or the inclusivist model, which many of us prefer, which says, okay, I can talk to anyone up to a certain point about anything, and then after when we reach that point of disagreement, we'll have to find another way of, of talking to each other about the implications of those disagreements. Now, bottom line again, if you teach culture and you teach religion in military operations and it doesn't have an ethical component to it and how you handle these differences, then we are missing most of what we need to do to help these guys in uniform as they go out to serve us. Okay. Uh, do we have time for questions? All right. Great. Thank you. necessary to ask for our goodwill. Aren't these people who go into different cultures in the same position? Yes. And there is another question that I have about the complexity of it all. I cannot see that so much multitasking will work. I think it works against the division of labor. The rule of the division of labor is really required consideration 
in order to get good work. So I'm not so sure that this has been brought down on a simpler level. And one of the levels would be to ask where we go in for the goodwill of the people because, as you said, we will offend somebody. Inevitably. We cannot be that all-knowing. So what do we do is my question. Thank you. I'm going to defer part of that question to the JAG officer because I know it says thank you right now. Okay. <laughs> Because part of when the United States as a military force goes into another country, there is a, a question of whether or not we can do it without asking the buy your leave. Now, generally speaking, I agree. Asking, you know, do you need our help? Can we help? Can we do something to help you out here? Is probably a good idea. It's a little unrealistic in cases like Rwanda, where international law says that if you call it genocide, you're going. All right. So we have the international humanitarian law, and then we have our own hegemonic power that says, okay, we're going to Afghanistan, take out Al-Qaeda, and by the way, while we're there, we'll do the Taliban. That's questionable in, in, in sovereign law and policy, but I'm going to let her do that better than me. As a matter of principle, as a matter of, of good manners, that dialogue that precedes anything having to do with the military, or, thank you very much, but economic development aid, as you know, is power. Food is a weapon of war. Food is a weapon of influence. So is humanitarian aid. So when we, as a country, are projecting power and influence in another country, asking permission, cooperation, and as Dr. Johnson says, walking alongside people instead of in front of them or behind them, is probably the best way to walk together. Now, whether or not that's scriptural from the book of, uh, let's see, Psalms, I'm not quite sure. Thank you. I'm an academic, more or less. Work for the Marine Corps, more or less. Um, I'm, and I'm old. So what I appreciate is civilized kindness in vocabulary. Whether that means we no longer use particular racial epithets or statements about females or Irish or any other group of, of people that we identify and put jokes next to, and we tend to be more polite and gracious with each other, I'm all for it. And if they want to call it political correctness, fine. If political correctness limits our ability to talk about ideas, then that's a bad thing. But if it makes us more gracious and informed in the, in the way we get to those major points, let's hear it, okay? Now, the second thing, Islam is, is not communism. It is not a political system. They have many political systems. Every country that has Sharia has it in a different way depending on its cultural attributes. So if you go to Morocco and then go to Saudi Arabia and then end up in e Indonesia, you have different cultures different applications of religious principles, different Sharia. It's about like United States law, which is, let's see, Spanish, indigenous, French, English, and then our own variety of things. We have precedent and we have code. Fine, so which law do, which law do we have? Is this Christian law? No, you can find Christian principles. Is it Christian law? No. Is it Old Testament? Absolutely not we have a particular kind of cultural adaptation that works for us in the United States about our laws and our principles. Right. 1.3 billion Muslims aren't out to kill us. Right. This ideology is not a predictive analysis. Communism was a different kind of political program than Islam is. Now, there will be Islamists that you know about, Qutb, other, incidentally, and who's the guy, I guess it was him that went to school in Greeley, Colorado which is where I'm from. My theory about that is he just didn't get invited to dance that night. So, because I know that Methodist church, believe me, nothing goes on in Greeley, Colorado. It's even a, it's a blue town, so they don't even have alcohol on the weekends. Okay. They don't have alcohol at all, period. Um, 
Islam is not a political agenda. It is not a worldwide agenda. There are Islamists who have political and worldwide agendas. They are the minority. But if you're going to go to the world's largest Muslim country, it's Indonesia. Okay. And incidentally, there are more Muslims in India than there are Hindus. So what are we trying to say? We're going to take a few and uh, blame the many because it's convenient, because it fits good guy, bad guy thing, because it fits us against the world, because we need a new enemy. This one we have to be no more sophisticated about because although the number of conflicts have gone down in the world in the last 10 years, the potential lethality has gone up. And if we blame those people who would be our friends simply because they are of a different religion, we are going to shoot ourselves in the foot in a few other places. So some Islamic countries are very friendly to the United States, good allies, check out Turkey, go to Turkey and enjoy, really enjoy. Um, thank you very much, they don't always agree with us. We wouldn't want them to, we do need some people who will tell truth to power. We need to learn to listen to truth to power also as a country. Your point, sir, was, was made, all right? Um, natural law, way over my pay grade, okay? <laughs> Because, but but if, you, if you are a faith-based person and do scripture and want to read that first chapter, first two chapters in the Book of Romans, you can go to natural law in Christian heritage, Judaic heritage, and Islam, which 95% agrees with Christian and Jewish tradition. Okay. So, yeah, it's a good part, part of, dis, of discourse, a good part, point, point of departure, probably for me. Uh, on, on the culture point, I, I'm okay. interested in how do we uh, deal with the spread of, of supercultural ideologies? For example, the, uh, the Saudi funding of, of Wahhabi uh, madrasas all over the world, or the ability of internet link groups like Al Qaeda to reach across these traditional cultural differences in Islam that you just talked about, which have been very marked, but to mm -hmm. seem to create a, a, a transnational veneer of a common ideology across those cultures. How, how does your analysis of that work? Okay, let, let me take two different questions. One is uh, madrasas. I've been in madrasas in China, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, India, Morocco, Egypt, right? Most of them don't have books and materials. Most of them have poorly educated or lower educated folks. A madrasa just means a religious school, so it could be very sophisticated with lots of good stuff and it can be, be just sort of memorization. Everything in between. Madrasa in itself is not a bad word. Okay, it's just a school. Now, one thing that Dr. Johnson did, which from here, you know, you do alternative ways of thinking that I loved. You'll love this, is this uh, illustration. He was in Pakistan talking to some of the militants in Pakistan. And he said, hmm, we know you, you love your children. We know that schools uh, are a priority for their, your children's advancement. Is there anything we can do to help? And one of these very militant says, yeah, we need books. So he managed to get, who knows how, a C5 full of textbooks in Arabic there. Talk about co-optation, love it. You ever seen, <laughs> ever seen a library with, oh, the ideas of the French Revolution? Wonderful, right? So, <laughs> so there, you know, math, science, whatever, et cetera. Now, on the, on the networking thing, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do something really hard. The young people have no problem with this, right? It's us older folks that really sort of take a look at this and say, oh my gosh, what are they looking at? Well, our, guy, our children look at YouTube. Some of this stuff is really awful. I'm kind of worried more about the disintegration and decadence of our country sometimes than what the outsiders pull in here, for heaven's sakes. And what, they, what we find our young people doing is taking what resonates with their reality and agreeing with it, what doesn't resonate with their reality, leaving it. That's good political science theory also. Politician will believe, be believed only to the extent that it resonates with the person's reality. If some politician gets up today and says, oh, the economy's just fine, I would say, what world are you living in? And I'll probably turn the channel, right? So I understand that strategic communication is important. I understand that there's a global networking of these things. I also understand off buttons. 
and like preachers of either ideology or religion, we turn off what we don't want to listen to, which makes an argument for families, communities, schools, PME, and other peer groups that say, hey, you know, don't do that. That's, that's nonsense. It doesn't work, it doesn't work here. It's very difficult to uh, persuade someone to do something really out of their life experience. Now, there are psychosociopaths in every country, including ours. I've worked in a men's penitentiary for two years. There's nobody guilty, incidentally, in the penitentiary. Somebody made them do it. Nevertheless, we have to dis disaggregate those vulnerable people and hostile people people with serious mental illness, the people who are weak, and those people who need to be encouraged to have the strength of their own convictions and be part of the community that we live in. Um, I, th I think what, what we do in PME in trying to in instilling the values of leadership and honor, courage, commitment, is, is a pretty good model for the rest of the country. I can hear you. It's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I've traveled around the world, and in some places, people say, no, you're not just saying that. You, you claim to be just an academic, but, but we know you're really sick. <laughs> never have been, never will be, but that was a perception. Why? What they see on television, Dallas, how many times have I been asked, oh, you're from Colorado, do you know, know JD? <laughs> sure, okay, yeah, okay. Denver, uh, by the way, do you uh, wear those kinds of things that they wear in the, mm, no. Uh, do you smoke? Well, no, never took that up. You can't, in Colorado, you can't smoke and breathe at the same time. <laughs> alcohol, sorry, I grew up in a family that no alcohol. So, y you know, what they see of us is not just what they see with you in uniform. What they see is the composite of their, their television, somebody who went to school in the United States and came home, which puts an onus on, onus on some of the universities to do a little bit better job of that, what they read in the newspapers, what the BBC said about us, et cetera. So they have composite ideas about the ec our economics, um, development people, our missionaries, our television media stuff, that is more than the sum total of the uniform personnel. You carry an additional burden, which is a gun. I grew up in South Chicago, before I moved to Colorado, before my parents got smart and moved to Colorado. Grew up in South Chicago and learned to walk the streets and could fight with a razor blade in my hand before I was 12, right? Street smart. Um, when the policemen came to our neighborhood, they got rocks thrown at them. They were there to help serve and protect justice, right, in South Chicago. I never threw a rock, honest. Okay. But we didn't like them, not because we saw them as people, but, we, but we, because we saw them as force. We saw them as a gun. We saw them as a potential for harming us. When you walk into an area, you are, I'm sorry, I'm talking to a gentleman now in uniform, or ladies in uniform. You're big, you have guns, you have the American flag and the big elephant behind you, right? Why wouldn't they be afraid of you? Their experience with people in uniform has been rape, pillage, destruction. You come in uniform and you come with guns and getting over that has meant that since Kosovo and Bosnia, we've tried to say, okay, good force protection, but if good force protection includes taking off the sunglasses, 
take off the sunglasses. If good force protection means lowering your voice and speaking in a calm tone and a quiet tone, do it. If good force protection means understanding this, you're doing it not just for them, but for yourself to accomplish the mission. Now, everybody wants to be loved. Military people will not be loved. They won't even be thanked, not even by your own country, let alone theirs. Right? So if you do it for the wrong reason, if you do it to be loved and to be appreciated because it's the right thing to do, you're screwed. Right? If you do it because you are serving the country, if you do it because it's the right thing to do, and you can look at yourself in the mirror at night and say, I did the right thing, that has to be enough. It has to be enough. Because the country won't thank you, I'm sorry. It, it, except in your funeral services, the country will not thank you sufficiently, not even the VA. Okay? And the country that you're serving in will not thank you because this takes short-term and long-term thinking, which is generally not possible in warfare. Now, I have a son serving. His mommy thanks him. <laughs> As a citizen, I thank him. <laughs> but I'll have to make one more comment. I have two sons. One, one serves in the State Department. He's been in more war zones than my Marine Corps son has. And they have arguments on Thanksgiving. Who's the most honorable service person? <laughs> okay. One in uniform with a gun, one without. But it's, just, it's the same principle of if you do it for the right reason and you know that you stand as an honorable person, that has to be enough for your life. That sounded more like it. Can I take the offering? <laughs> Thank you so much.